How's it everyone who's watching this? This is my 31st video on the channel, and today we're going to be finishing off Chapter 1 of Intensive Science and Virtual Philosophy by Manuel de Landa, The Mathematics of the Virtual. Last time, we explored what Deleuze means when he talks about multiplicities and some of their mathematical properties, drawing from differential geometry, dynamical systems theory, and group theory. We also introduced the concept of singularities, differentiation, with a C, and intensive and extensive properties. Because of how dense Delana's writing is, I really recommend watching the last episode if you haven't already. I'll link it in the comments. To jump right into it, at this point in the chapter, Delana's main goal is to outline what his argument has been thus far. He begins by talking about the main focus of our last episode, that being the formal distinctions between multiplicities and essences. To give a quick rundown, essences are basically idealized archetypes that certain philosophers, such as Plato, saw as being the main source of what makes up our world. For example, cats are cats because they are representations of the idea of the perfect feline, the essence of a cat. Deleuze developed multiplicities to counter this viewpoint, presenting a morphogenetic way of viewing being. That's to say, a viewpoint that focuses on the processes that give rise to certain forms, not on some eternal identity. For Deleuze, multiplicities are imminent, as opposed to transcendent. What this means is that they deal directly with material processes. They don't exist in some magical realm separate to ours, like essences, but rather exist concretely. Additionally, in Delana's words, Multiplicities form a real dimension of the world, a non-metric, continuous space which progressively specifies itself, giving rise to our familiar metric space as well. This will be the focus of next episode, where we'll get more into what Deleuze's understanding of spaces, and what it means for it to be specified. For now though, Delana wants to look at three final things. Number one, how Deleuze's ontology stacks up against those of other so-called state-space ontologists, metaphysicians who use mathematical models like manifolds or multiplicities to explore being. Number two, the relationship between such an ontology and modal logic. And number three, the speculative side of Deleuze's project. To begin with though, what is a state space? Like the name suggests, this refers to a way of representing the possible states of a certain process in terms of space. According to Delanda, ontologies based on such spaces have become increasingly popular in analytic philosophy, largely due to a movement away from more abstract mathematical fields like set theory and formal logic, in favor of those fields that scientists actually use in their everyday practice. However, he caveats, very few of these projects go as far as the losers, or otherwise resemble it. For example, one of the most notable differences between his state space ontology and those of analytic tradition is that the latter, at least in Delanda's eyes, largely neglects what we discussed last episode as singularities, points or cycles that organize the trajectories of certain processes. To delve into their differences in more depth, Delanda says that we first need to understand how state spaces are constructed in the first place. Everything begins with two operators, differentiation and integration. Defining them, the first refers to a way of instantaneously calculating values from a rate of change between two or more variables. To give an example, the relationship between position and time can be differentiated into velocity, termed a vector in this case. Moving on to the second, the other operator, integration, performs the opposite but complementary task. From the instantaneous values, it reconstructs a full trajectory or series of states. Basically, the values produced from differentiation can be integrated in order to create a path that maps how they change over time. When it comes to the creation of state spaces, these go hand in hand. First, you choose a manifold on which to model the process, a space composed of as many dimensions as there are variables. Next, experimentation can be used to find some real-life trajectories, which can then be mapped onto our manifold of choice. These trajectories can in turn be individually subjected to the differentiation which finds a vector for each one. The end result of this process is what is known as a vector field, a space populated, as the name suggests, with vectors. The final step is taking this field and integrating it, allowing the person developing the model to approximate future states. This construction is termed a phase portrait, and in Deleuze's ontology, is strictly separated from vector fields. Despite the fact that the precise nature of each singular point is well-defined only in the face portrait. 
the existence and distribution of these singularities is already completely given in the vector field. To break this down, vector fields allow us to grasp the tendencies that organize trajectories in a system. Even if it's only in the more general phase portrait of a given process, that those tendencies are obvious. For example, the point attractor that organizes a pendulum swings when it's subject to friction, the long-term tendency to reach equilibrium, can be observed experimentally in the vector field. We can see how its velocity approaches zero. That's where the singularity is distributed. Moving on, he adds that trajectories only ever grow closer and closer to the attractors that influence them, never actually reaching them. On account of outside factors, the pendulum never attains perfect equilibrium, for example. In this way, singularities, despite being real, are never actually actualized. However, this isn't to say that trajectories are unstable. Even when under the influence of outside forces, as long as they don't leave its basin of attraction, trajectories still have a steady state near to their attractor, even if it isn't exactly the same as the attractor itself. In Delander's eyes, the other important feature that defines singularities is their structural stability, the distribution of attractors themselves. Like how the stability of trajectories can be measured by introducing outside forces, the stability of attractors can be measured by nesting one vector field into another, and seeing if they are, to use his words, topologically equivalent. What this means is that the original vector field doesn't have its structure changed. No bifurcations take place, no point attractors become periodic, and periodic attractors become chaotic, so on and so on. Most distributions of attractors are stable, hence why similar behavior can be observed in a large range of systems. However, when changes are big enough, this stability disappears. To give a concrete example, let's take another look at the pendulum, this time frictionless. In these conditions, its swings are organized around the periodic attractor, moving from one state to another without ever slowing down enough to reach equilibrium. Its vector field can be deduced from the trajectory of its movement, which is relatively simple. However, when another pendulum is connected to it, and thus another vector field is nested inside its own, this all changes. Now, we don't have a simple oscillation between states, but rather behavior that is seemingly chaotic. This pendulum vector field is thus unstable, undergoing bifurcation. With this, Delander says, it's possible to give a formal mathematical definition of multiplicities. A multiplicity is a nested set of vector fields related to each other by symmetry-breaking bifurcations, together with the distributions of attractors which define each of its embedded levels. This is quite a daunting way of putting it, but we can visualize it like so. Essentially, a multiplicity is filled with a myriad of different vector fields or distributions of singularities. These are related to each other by their ability to change distribution when under certain conditions. This is a very abstract way of explaining multiplicities, but Delanda will eventually transform it to be more philosophical in nature in the following chapters. For now, it's useful because it separates singularities from the trajectories they organize, important for what comes next. At this point, an obvious question is what exactly the ontological status of multiplicities is. Given their separation from actual trajectories, or I'll talk about the realization of embryogenesis and hydrodynamic flows in the last video, it may seem that they are somehow unreal, separate from the material world. However, this isn't so. Instead, they are part of what Deleuze terms the virtual, not in the sense of some kind of virtual reality, but rather as a vital component of a material world. Quoting Deleuze himself, The reality of the virtual consists of the differential elements and relations along with the singular points which correspond to them. The reality of virtual is structure. It's here that Lander introduces modal logic, the study of necessity and possibility, as a way to examine the status of multiplicities. As an introduction to the field, he states that most approaches usually focus on language and statements expressing what could have been. Like the sentence, if JFK hadn't been assassinated, then the Vietnam War would have ended sooner. Such a statement produces the idea of a possible world. For example, one where JFK didn't die. However, this world is devoid of any structure. Possibilities have a tendency to blend into each other in this approach to modal logic, language leading to all sorts of ambiguities. For example, take the statement there is a possible fat man and a possible bald man in the doorway. The analytic philosopher Willard van Orman Quayne joked that there is no way of telling if there is only one possible bald and fat man, 
two separate men, or even a myriad of unmentioned thin men that outnumber the original one or two mentioned in the sentence. However, there are ways of approaching modal logic that are less ambiguous. Most interesting for us is the system developed by the philosopher of science, Ronald Geary, who suggested state spaces could solve this dilemma. By modeling trajectories in such a space through the use of differentiation and integration, the face portrait would essentially diagram all the possible worlds linked to said trajectories, based on specific starting conditions and relations. However, the problem now becomes what ontological status to give these trajectories. One position is what Geary terms actualism. For actualists, no matter how separated or individuated a possible trajectory is from others around it, it has no reality. It's just a tool, a useful fiction as Delana puts it, for figuring out the dynamics of systems experimentally. In Geary's eyes, this viewpoint is necessarily flawed, since for him, what matters is not how a process unfolds under certain specific conditions, but rather how it unfolds under all conditions, even those that can't be actualized. As should be patently clear, Deleuze wasn't an actualist either. Rather, in Delanda's words, He held a realist position towards the modal structure of state space, but would have disagreed with Geary in his interpretation of what constitutes that modal structure. The main difference between the two philosophers comes down to the ontological significance of singularities for Deleuze. Whilst Geary is content to use the face portrait, Deleuze cares more about the vector field and the singularities that structure it. To borrow the latter's words, singularities necessarily preside over the genesis of trajectories, so by ignoring them through jumping straight to the face portrait is a mistake. Moving on, it's time to address the modality of singularities themselves. As we've already seen, they aren't actual. Trajectories simply move endlessly closer towards them without ever actually arriving. Using the tools of modal logic, we can see that the possible is an insufficient category to explain singularities, since they necessarily can't be occupied by any trajectory. We can try to explain them now with the other main part of modal logic, necessity, but this also falls short. Necessity implies a kind of determinism, where a certain thing must happen, but singularities simply don't work like that. Although it's true that trajectories end up in a specific state due to them, chance also plays a major role. This is because of how basins of attraction work. Any bifurcation or big enough change can dislodge a trajectory from one attractor is organized around. At this point, Delana stresses that this isn't what Deleuze himself argued, but rather a natural consequence of a Deleuzean ontology. Although he did see the notion of a possible as fundamentally problematic, Deleuze attacked the notion from a more generally philosophical viewpoint, drawing heavily from the work of Henri Bergson. An essay from whom I'll pin in the comments to hopefully make the differences between actual, virtual, real, and possible clear for anyone who's interested. To understand some of his arguments, Delanda says we should now turn to the constraints that organize the speculative side of Deleuze's work on the virtual. As our author says, One such constraint is to avoid at all costs conceptualizing virtual multiplicities as eternal essences. There's something quite tempting about essences, especially when it comes to possible worlds in modal logic, or actual parallel dimensions in certain strands of physics. Quoting directly again, When thinking about these parallel universes, both philosophers and physicists assume the existence of fully formed individuals populating the different possible worlds. Firstly, there's the answer that trans world identities are kept stable by some kind of essence individual to each person. Secondly, there's the answer that every world only contains counterparts distinct from each other. Although maybe less obvious, this also presupposes a general essence that allows them to resemble each other. Deleuze's alternative focuses on morphogenesis itself, rather than on identity. He isn't concerned with how things maintain identities beyond, between worlds, but rather with what processes of individuation produce actual forms from virtual space. The possible is problematic because it assumes a set of predefined identities that are realized identically. As Bergson says, there's this act of projection which makes the possible more than the real, insofar as the possible can only be deduced from realized results. In the virtual actual framework, both are equally real and neither resembles the other. In Deleuze's own words, The possible and the virtual are distinguished by the fact that one refers to the form of identity in the concept, whereas the other designates as a pure multiplicity. 
The second constraint to lose users as a guide for his thought involves avoiding typological thinking. In other words, a way of conceiving individuation that places an emphasis on the creation of classifications. Although these classifications often go hand in hand with essences, they don't have to. For example, Aristotle talked about natural states, states imminent to individuals that they tend towards. Natural states are typological in the sense that they involve grouping people or things, first under species or types, and then genera. The issue with this way of looking at being is that honesty isn't all that useful as a basis for an ontology. Tillander explains why using the example of botanical taxonomy. Four things are at play, resemblance, identity, analogy, and opposition. Toulouse lovingly calls these the shackles of representation, indifference, and repetition. To begin with, resemblance was first used in taxonomy to group plants into sets based on physical appearance. In Tillander's words, this amounted to a translation of their visible features into a linguistic representation, a tabulation of identities which allowed the assignment of individuals to an exact place in an ordered table. Taking these identities, higher order classes were produced through analogy, grouping lower level ones together based on perceived similarities. Finally, relationships of opposition were established to create dichotomies and more elaborate hierarchies. The final result of this fourfold process was the production of a static, fixed system of classifications, one that completely ignores the temporal, fluid nature of evolution. At this point, it's important to note that Deleuze doesn't see these elements as non-existent. Some things obviously resemble others, objects do maintain their identities over time, etc. Rather, he views them as insignificant in relation to difference, being nothing more than the surface level results of deeper, underlying processes. Now. This concludes the second half of chapter 1 from Manuel de Landa's book, Intensive Science and Virtual Philosophy. I truly hope you enjoyed or learned something, and if you feel I got anything wrong or wasn't as clear as I could have been, please do feel free to let me know in the comments so I can do better. Next time, we'll start chapter 2, titled The Actualization of a Virtual in Space, and begin our exploration into how multiplicities give rise to physical forms. Until then, bye!